So I thought I would talk to you about enterovirus D68, which has been the outbreak this year, um, which has been overshadowed by, overshadowed by Ebola from mostly, um, and, but you may have heard of um, the enterovirus D68 a little bit earlier in the season. So I thought I would go through that with you in terms of what our experience has been and what we're seeing and what some of the implications are. Um, this is my disclosure, I get a small operating grant from Merck, and the objectives are really to review the change in epidemiology of enterovirus D68 um, that we saw in 2014, or understand the range of clinical presentations that we see from this virus, and to review some of the uh, unknowns and uh, future implications um, from uh, enterovirus D68. So the taxonomy for enterovirus is actually very complicated and has changed recently. So just to sort of orient you that um, you might be aware of some of the, the old taxonomy that we used to differentiate enteroviruses by um, their serotypes. And that would be polioviruses versus Coxsackie viruses or echoviruses or other enteroviruses. Uh, with the onset of genetics and better viral identification, it's changed now um, to uh, this number, this lettered system, human enterovirus A through D, and all of these have been jumbled up and moved into here, and enterovirus 68 is in uh, a human enterovirus D, is where its name comes from. Enterovirus is a uh, late summer, early fall virus. And this is a summary from CDC over 20 years of sort of what we see yearly with enterovirus. And you can see the bulk of the cases are from yearly outbreaks between July and October, okay, in this time period. And this is very predictable every year. There's about 10 different strains that cause 70% of these outbreaks. And the, most of the strains are felt to be of low epidemic potential. And enterovirus 68 was in that group that we felt had low epidemic potential, and we didn't see causing these outbreaks in the past. Um, there's a variety of clinical manifestations of enterovirus. The vast majority are actually undifferentiated fever. So you wouldn't be able to tell the difference between any other sort of viral infection, influenza, parainfluenza, RSV that walks in the door. There are a subset of enterovirus infections that are clinically distinguishable, and those are usually the exanthems, hand, foot, and mouth disease, um, and, uh, and other exanthems. And these are just pictures of what you might see with hand, foot, and mouth disease. Enterovirus can also cause a variety of respiratory infections, upper and lower respiratory tract. It also causes central nervous system disease with meningitis or encephalitis, and rarely can also cause acute paralysis. Um, there's um, known cardiac effects. You can get myocarditis or pericarditis from different enteroviruses, and also neonatal sepsis as a, a significant presentation. So that just sort of gives you the spectrum of illness that you can see with the different enterovirus serotypes. Enterovirus D68 was discovered in 1962 uh, by uh, this group of authors, and they described it in four children that were admitted with lower respiratory infections, pneumonia, bronchiolitis. And they give a good description in this paper about the uh, nuances of the virus and distinguishing features. Um, and it's actually much more similar to rhinoviruses than it is to other enteroviruses, both in terms of its biology and also, as we saw, in terms of its epidemiology over the coming years. I show you this uh, illegible graph or chart just so you can see that CDC tracks um, the uh, enterovirus serotypes over time. This is over about a 35-year period of the different enterovirus types that you might see. And um, there's over 30,000 different viruses that they've typed. And enterovirus D68 was in there. This was released in about 2005 or 2006. And it was ranked number 47 of all the enteroviruses that they identified. And only 26 strains were typed as D68 up between 1970 and 2006 out of the tens of thousands that they had typed before. And like I said, we didn't think it had a lot of epidemic potential. We didn't see much enterovirus D68. Until 2011, CDC published this report of a series of outbreaks from this virus. There was one in Asia, one in Europe, and one in the U.S. In total, there was about 100 children, and they mostly had severe respiratory illness, asthma exacerbation-like symptoms, um, and there were three deaths reported from this case series. And then more recently, there was a published um, CDC report in MMWR in uh, September of 2014 from Missouri and Illinois um, that they saw clusters of severe respiratory illness that were typed as enterovirus D68. And I'll show you, this is a graph from um, Mercy City Hospital in um, 
uh, in Missouri, which uh, originally sort of alerted to the outbreak. Um, and this is some of the data they presented at IDSA. Um, and this is just results from their uh, multiplex PCR panel that detects a series of viruses, mostly performed on inpatients at their um, children's hospital. And what you can see is there are, there are baseline rate interseasonal levels, about seven cases a week of either enterovirus or rhinovirus. Most of the PCR assays can't differentiate the two. In the um, peak season, they see maybe about 30 cases a week. And then this is what they saw this year, a huge spike in cases up to a maximum of about 230 cases. And this was in context of their hospitalists and uh, physicians saying they were seeing a lot more asthma than they normally expect in the fall, and also a lot more severe asthma, sending more kids to the ICU than they normally would expect with severe asthma exacerbations. And so this is just a, a summary of a few different places that have published some of their results, or at least released some of their results, about what they've seen with enterovirus D68. So just to have a look at Kansas City and Chicago and Illinois. So Kansas City sent 22 specimens from the ICU with severe asthma, and 19 of them were positive for D68. Similarly, Chicago sent 14, and 11 were positive, again, similarly from very severe asthma exacerbations. Calgary has reported nine on a variety of hospitalized patients. Um, and what you can see, most of them were younger, the median age of four. Most of them had a history of wheezing or asthma in the past. They were all very severe, but this is a select, um, you know, sort of biased group of patients for severe asthma exacerbation. Um, and uh, most of them were afebrile, actually. So um, uh, only about three quarters of the patients were afebrile when they were admitted. Um, Calgary has now confirmed about 60 cases um, in their hospital. And at St. Joe's, our uh, pediatricians have sent about 53 specimens um, uh, to date to look for enterovirus D68 in a variety of respiratory complaints. Um, and we have seven positive in our hospital. Ten of them are still pending. And what we see are... are um, uh, Similarly, age range, so median age of about four, the range of 15 months to 11 years. Three females, four males. 60% had a previous history of weeds when they were admitted. Um, two of the children were co-infected with other viruses. They actually had three viruses detected, enterovirus D68, parainfluenza 4, and, another, and a rhinovirus. And that was in two separate children. They were generally mild, mild illness. The length of stay was median of one day. They were sent home usually the next day. The longest day was four days. Uh, most of them had normal chest x-rays. Three out of four who had chest x-rays. One had some minor changes. And two of them required a brief period of oxygen, um, but then was quickly weaned off. And otherwise, they were managed as typical asthmatics with Ventolin steroids and sent home. I think this gives you a useful perspective that um, what we're seeing in a community hospital is obviously different than what they're seeing in tertiary hospitals and in ICUs, but it gives you the spectrum of disease from enterovirus D68. So overall in Canada, so there's only, just to give you the call, there's only one lab that does the test, and that's in Winnipeg, and it's cumbersome to do. So we've confirmed about 150 cases across the country. It's likely a little bit higher now. And the U.S. has confirmed about 1,105 cases. Overall, about 40% of the specimens the CDC has tested have been positive for enterovirus D68. And it's by far the most common virus that we identified um, in this sort of time period of late summer, early fall. This, is, this graph in the U.S. is um, uh, produced from the CDC. And what you can see is that, and this is a little bit uh, out of date, in that they're seeing the lighter colors are the states that are showing declining cases, and there's sort of informal reports that there's more decline that we would expect in November now for enterovirus in general. So what this tells us is that enterovirus was likely the most common virus that we saw this year. Um, there were probably millions of cases across North America with a range of clinical presentations. There have been nine deaths reported to be related to enterovirus D68. It's unclear the, the relationship of those deaths to actually the enterovirus D68. Um, there was one that was heavily publicized in New Jersey about a child that died with this virus. We know that that child also had Staph aureus bacteremia, right? So the CDC is investigating all of these uh, deaths to see what actual relationship there is. But what we know is that this was a common virus that we saw this, um, this season. So I'm going to switch gears slightly and talk about um, acute flaccid paralysis and the sort of the questionable relationship that we're seeing, um, you're seeing with that. 
So in also in um, September, later September of uh, this year, MMWR released a report of acute neurological illness in children from uh, the Denver Children's Hospital in Colorado. In that report, they reported nine cases. They now that hospital now has ten with uh, acute flaccid paralysis, severe extremity weakness, severe cranial nerve dysfunction, diplopia, facial weakness. Uh, the median age was eight years of age, which ranged between one and eighteen. All the children had a preceding respiratory prodrome of a median of a week before they presented, and most of them were fully vaccinated, including for polio. One child was unvaccinated by parental choice. They tested eight specimens for enterovirus D68. Four of them were positive. Um, they had one that was positive for rhinovirus and adenovirus, and one for a totally different enterovirus. All of their MRI findings were similar. This is, um, this is not, none of theirs, but this is what it would look like. It's basically that you have non-enhancing gray matter lesions in the, in the um, spinal cord and also in the brain stem for children that had cranial nerve involvement. They tested all of their stools for enterovirus and poliovirus, and those were all negative. So as of October, so CDC had declared an outbreak because of this and started trying to investigate more cases. So as of October 29th, the CDC released that they have um, identified 64 confirmed cases that meet their case definitions across 28 states in the U.S. They haven't reported how many of those are positive for enterovirus D68. I can tell you that in Ontario, we have nine cases. Um, as far as I know, only one of them has come back positive for enterovirus D68. One was a rhinovirus, one was a different enterovirus. Okay. Um, and BC reported two cases, uh, or at least that to, reported that to ProMed, um, which is sort of an infectious disease email service, and uh, two, they were both causative, positive for enterovirus D68. Also yesterday, a hospital in France reported one case that meets this case definition and was positive for um, D68 as well. So... What we have basically are increased clusters of polio-like illness with acute flaccid paralysis where some of them seem to be associated with enterovirus D68. At least we've been able to isolate it in some of them. So in terms of the plausibility, um, we know that enterovirus can cause or be associated with acute flaccid paralysis. Um, this is a study from Hong Kong which reviewed um, a few hundred um, uh, cases. And when they did find a virus, which was in about a fifth of the time, uh, the most common virus that they found was a non-polio enterovirus. So in the era of polio, virus, of polio vaccine, we still see acute flaccid paralysis, although rarely, and can be associated with non-polio enteroviruses. Specifically for enterovirus D68, there are two case reports in the literature that have described a similar syndrome of acute flaccid paralysis that have been associated with enterovirus D68. So giving it some plausibility. Okay, but this is obviously, it was a rare virus before this year, and acute flaccid paralysis, especially with the sort of anterior myelitis that we were seeing, was a very rare occurrence. So basically what we know from this outbreak is that there's been an outbreak of polio-like illness across North America um, in several areas uh, in, in uh, multiple different states and multiple areas across Canada. This outbreak has been temporarily associated with um, enterovirus D68. Um, and, uh, and unfortunately, none of the children have fully recovered, at least um, as far as uh, Colorado had reported earlier this month, or as far as I'm aware, that at least in the first several months after the illness, all the children have persistent deficits, similar that we would see in polio. So what we don't know, I think, at this point is, it, is this paralysis causal from enterovirus D68? Is it direct viral effect of um, similar to polio? Is it coincidental? Is it that we have this outbreak of respiratory illness and we, you know, I told you that the millions of children are infected, most common virus that we're seeing. So is it coincidental that these children just happen to have this virus in their nose which can stay there for weeks after an illness and that they have some other reason for, for paralysis? Or is it some post-infectious sort of inflammatory phenomenon that may be related to this virus or any virus? And we happen to be, again, detecting it in the nose week, like a week or several weeks after their acute illness from enterovirus D68, but isn't directly related to that virus. And these are some of the questions that are really being actively investigated, and I don't have good answers for this. And so I think it's important to realize that there's clearly an outbreak of acute flaccid paralysis, which is more than we would expect to see, and it seems to be temporarily associated with enterovirus D68, but whether it's causal at this point, I think is, is difficult to say. 
I'll just spend a, a, you know, a few brief moments talking about treatment, uh, but basically there is no uh, effective treatment for enterovirus infection and it's largely supportive. We give IVIG to um, uh, children with severe enterovirus infection. There's some case series in neonates that, um, uh, that they maybe do a little bit better with IVIG. Other treatments are really, you know, um, experimental or controversial. A lot of the children with paralysis were getting steroids, um, which is concerning, at least, that if it is actually a direct viral infection, we know that children with ent severe enterovirus, especially enterovirus 71 outbreak, um, did much worse, actually, when those who got steroids and didn't. Um, the ones with asthma, uh, most of them are treated with steroids and seem to get better. So I think it's reasonable for those children to treat them as you would any asthmatic. Um, but I think it would be cautious with the uh, paralysis. And also plasmapheresis has been tried as well, which again, there's no data for. Um, there are a number of experimental drugs. One is placonorol, um, which has some promising uh, activity in neonatal um, and severe enterovirus disease. But that drug and these other experimental drugs have no in vitro activity against D68. So that's not going to be, in the near future, a plausible sort of antiviral treatment option. So just to end with this, just to summarize, so enterovirus D68 emerges here as a predominant enterovirus strain this summer and fall. Spectrum of illness was likely asymptomatic to mild infection, which, I, which would be in most children. Um, there was uh, lower respiratory infection or severe asthma exacerbation in a subset of children, especially those that were younger and uh, had a history of asthma or previous wheezing or sort of were predisposed to asthma. We've seen clusters of acute flaccid paralysis in Canada and the United States, uh, which has been associated temporally with enterovirus D68, but we really need to study this more to better define the association. But it's a critical um, um, sort of decision to make and sort of understanding to develop, because if the enterovirus D68 is associated with an emergence of a polio-like illness, it'll have huge implications, I think, for um, future vaccine development that'll be rapidly targeted against this virus. And if we're seeing um, in future seasons, we're going to see continuing epidemic uh, spread on a seasonal basis from D68. Um, it'll be very important to sort of keep in mind in future seasons uh, what we're going to be seeing. Uh, so there's a few references, and um, I think uh, I'll hand it over and then come back at the end and happy to answer any questions you might have or in discussion about it. Thank you.